Today I'm excited to introduce you all to Dr. Masha Makarova. She is a postdoctoral fellow at the Rutgers Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And today she is going to be speaking to us about reconstructing past climate using microfossils. So you can, the stage is all yours, Masha. Go ahead. Thank you, Ria. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I'm really excited and honored to be here with you today uh, to give a lecture on the um, reconstruction of the past climate using microfossils. And I'm really excited for this opportunity to be a part of the Ask a Geology series organized by the Rutgers Geology Museum. Um, but before we start, I would like to introduce myself to you. My name is, as Ria said, my name is Masha Makarova. And I was geologist for almost a half of my life. And I started my education in geology in Moscow, Russia. This is where I'm from. And I did my bachelor and master's degree in petroleum geology. I was studying um, origin of oil and gas and the ways how we search for uh, fossil fuels. But then I moved to New Jersey and I earned two degrees, master's and PhD at Rutgers University at the department of the earth and planetary sciences. And I switched my research from petroleum exploration to studying ocean and the climate of our planet. And here's me at Rutgers graduation in 2014 by myself. And four years later in 2018 with my PhD advisor, Dr. Ken Miller, who gave a talk on sea level change a week ago. If you missed that, go to Geology Museum and uh, check what, uh, what he was talking about, the sea level change. And unfortunately, I can't really see you guys, but I definitely know that there's one thing that we share in common, which is our planet. And my job is to look at the past of our planet and see how it changed through time. I am a paleoclimatologist. This is a scientific name for my expertise. Paleo means past and climatology means study of climate. Though personally, I see myself as a detective, but not the uh, detective that deals with the crimes, but a climate detective trying to reconstruct what happened with the climate of our planet in the past and what things were responsible for those climate changes. The main interest of my um, of my research are uh, global warming events that happened millions of years ago. And for my PhD, I studied this global warming that is called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum that initiated 56 million years ago. And here's this uh, reconstruction of the uh, of our planet, how it uh, looked like 56 million years ago. And funny fact about myself, even though I was trained as petroleum geologist in Russia, my favorite topic was paleontology. I really enjoy studying the evolution and uh, of our um, species on our planet and study fossils. And um, I would never imagine that um, when I decided to switch my research interests to climate studies, that paleontology or specifically micropaleontology is very important part um, in our reconstruction of our um, past climate. So um, for my research, I occasionally go on the field and here's the photographs from the drilling operation. Here's the drilling truck that we used to get um, course at Medford, New Jersey. And over here are the photographs of those uh, sedimentary cores. And you see this bright contrast over here in the sediments. This is the onset of this global warming event, the Paleocene East and Thermal Maximum that I studied for my PhD. So I not only study sediments that are associated with the changes in the climate, but I also look at the tiny shells of the microorganisms. Um, and I get those shells from the sediments. I study them under the microscope, and then I analyze their chemical composition using various sophisticated instruments in the lab. 
And the um, topic of our um, series today will be about using those microfossils for climate reconstructions. So when you hear the word fossil, what do you usually think about? Well, I immediately, before I became a geologist, I immediately thought about bones of the dinosaur or large marine shells or trilobites, something like this. But there is entirely very beautiful, a different world of other micro of other fossils that a lot of people don't know about. And the reason for that is that because we need to use microscope in order to study them. Some of these fossils we can't really see with our naked eye. Some of them are um, a sand size um, fossils. But in any ways, in order to see the details of those fossils, we need to use the microscope. And here's just a few examples of those microfossils that we can find. The ones on the right are the fossils that are made of the silica, um, organisms called radiolarians. They look like helmets and diatoms that look like pill boxes. And these organisms are planktonic organisms that usually prefer to live in the cold waters. But the ones on the left, this is the organisms that live to live in the warm waters. And they build shells that are made of the calcium carbonate. The one on the bottom is the coccolithophorid. Uh, these are very tiny, tiny organisms. They are very small in size. We even call them nanoplankton because they're that small. And if you've ever draw anything with the white chalk, this is what the chalk is made of, of the coccolithophorids. And this guy is this really beautiful shell that looks like a popcorn. It's called foraminifera. And these are the main microfossils that we actually use for the climate reconstructions. And I'm going to talk to you about forms today. Okay, so what are the foraminifera? Here I'm showing you a photograph of the life foraminifera. It's absolutely gorgeous. It floats in the water. Oops, floats in the water. It has this beautiful shell with a circular um, uh, chambers and you see this extensions over here. These are the pseudopods. This is the sticky extensions of this organism that foraminifera uses to catch their food. So where can we find forums? Well, I study uh, forums that are found in the um, deep shelf sediments and open ocean cores. However, we can also find forums when you go to the beach. Unfortunately, you won't find forums when you go to the Jersey Shore because the sand there is made of the uh, grains of quartz. It's, it has this yellowish color. But when you go to subtropical or tropical places where it's nice and warm, um, somewhere in the Caribbean or um, in the Indian Ocean, for example, this photograph is from Barbados, and you look at the sand, it's usually going to be white in color. And when you take the sand in your hands, it's not going to be made of grains of minerals. And if you toss it under the microscope, this is what you're going to see there. You're going to see the shells of foraminifera. So forums, this is how we call foraminifera for short, they've been known since the ancient time. And if you go to, if you heard about the pyramids in Egypt, they are made of the limestone that consists of foraminifera, which is called pneumolites. This foraminifera is larger in size. It, it has this flat shape that looks like coins. It's usually up to an inch in size. And Slave, who uh, built pyramids in Egypt, thought that this foraminifera are, uh, were petrified lentils and they were even eating them. But uh, really the, the, um, the study of foraminifera and definition them as the separate class of organism began in um, early 19th century with French geologist 
d'Orbigny, who first classified them as the separate class of organisms and who gave the name of foraminifera to them. And here's just the drawings, really absolutely gorgeous drawings of um, foraminifera that were made to describe shells of foraminifera. Okay, so what are the forums? Are they animals? Are they plants? Well, they are neither. Uh, they are unicellular eukaryotic organisms. We call them protists. They are made of only one single cell. And these organisms you, uh, build a um, skeleton around their, um, around their cell. For example, us or dinosaurs, we are vertebrates. We have the bone, we have the skeleton inside us. It's internal. But foraminifera build external skeleton or shell. Scientifically, we also call their shells tests. And these foraminiferal tests are microscopic. We need microscope to study them. Uh, they're typically less than one millimeter in size. And here I'm giving you the um, needle for scale. And here is the modern foraminifera globigerinoides rubber. Uh, that actually makes that beautiful um, pink beaches in the Bermudas and in the Bahamas. And here it is in the eye of a needle, just to give you a, an idea of what is the size of this um, foraminifera. Um, there are total approximately 30,000 species of foraminifera and 4,000 of them living in the ocean today. There are two types of foraminifera. The one um, most abundant of uh, today's living foraminifera are benthic foraminifera. Benthus in Greek means depth. So this foraminifera live on the ocean floor and the top of the ocean floor or within the top layer of the sediments. And only 40 species among foraminifera are planktonic or um, we, use this word to describe species that float in the water. And if you go to the warm um, subtropical, tropical ocean, places with the clear water, you will be actually see those little tiny shells of foraminifera. And this is how they look like. Absolutely gorgeous because they need to float in the water. They have this big um, circular chambers uh, that will enable them uh, to be light and float in the water. So how do we study foraminifera and how do we classify the fossils of foraminifera? We use microscope to do that. And we look at the different characteristics of the, shell, of the shells, such as their shape, the shape of their chambers and arrangement of the chambers, um, wall structure. Um, foraminifera also has different ornamentation on the surface of their shells. And we also look at the different composition of the, of the shells. Uh, um, in order to um, study foraminifera, we use this black trace where we place our sample with foraminifera uh, shells. It's black in color, obviously, because foraminifera shells are white. So to see them clearly, we need to use black. We use brush, really fine brush, to rotate them because we need to see the shape from every single side, front, back, and the side view. And then we place them on this um, slides, which are also black in color because forums are white. And one more thing that I just want to tell you where the name Foraminifera comes from. Uh, Foraminifera built chambers, and the wall between each chamber is called foramen. So that's why for a mini call that way. Okay, now that you know how the microfossils or specifically forms look like, now you probably have this question, uh, so what is the relationship between this tiny, tiny shells in the ocean and the climate of our entire planet? And that's a good question. And to, in order to answer that, let's first figure it out what is climate. Climate is a broad composite of average conditions in the region or the entire planet. When we talk about the climate, we use parameters that you might hear on the weather channel, um, such as temperature, precipitation, snow and ice cover, wind, humidity, and aridity. 
when we describe climate, we always talk about the long-term large scale. We usually talk about the time frame of more than 30 years up to millions of years. And climate is always regional or global for the entire planet. The weather uses exactly the same parameters to describe it, but it has much shorter um, scale operating on the hours, two weeks, and weather is always local. But when we compare climate and the weather, we can say that climate is the weather for more than 30 years. So now we have all those um, instruments to measure directly temperature, snow ice cover, wind. But when we talk about the past climate, unfortunately, there were no thermometers back in the times. And if we want to go back in the history of our planet to study climate that was present a thousand or a millions of years ago, we need to use indirect proxies, indirect measurements, which are also called proxies uh, from the various archives. And here's just a few climate archives that paleoclimatologists used for their research. Uh, we, we can use tree rings because each ring represents a year of growth and the width of each ring depends on the um, temperature and humidity. So the wider rings will indicate warmer and wetter climate. Uh, similar idea with the bands in corals. Uh, they reflect changes in the temperature and each band of the color represent one year of the growth. Another very sophisticated archive, uh, climate archive are coming from the cold areas. These are ice cores that have um, ancient air trapped in the air bubbles in the cores. And we also have cores of the sediments that are deposited in the lakes and in the ocean that can tell us the information about the ancient chemistry of the about the chemistry of the ancient um, ocean or lakes. And guess what? In those sediments, we can find foraminifera that will help us to determine the chemistry of the water. So, um, have you ever seen layered cake or probably ate it? Well, Earth works almost like that. It also has the layers in the ocean that are deposited on top of each other. And when you assemble cake, you start from the bottom and you finish on the top. So in the ocean, it's almost the same way. Uh, there are layers of sediments that are deposited on top of each other. And the layer at the bottom will represent the oldest sediment and the layer at the top will represent the most recent sediment. And within those sediments, we will find the fossils of both planktonic and benthic foraminifera. So in order to drill those cores, uh, we can go to the um, uh, open ocean locations in order to get deep sea sediments. And we drill for the sediments using uh, this drilling ship, which is called uh, Joy Dis Resolution. And the program that does scientific research of the exploration of the oceans called International Ocean Discovery Program. A lot of faculty and students at Rutgers University were part of this um, program. And a lot of cores that we study, sediments, are cores that were obtained through this program. So the ship has a hole in the center of the ship through which the drilling assembly goes down. And it can go down through a very thick water, um, water column up to a mile or a couple of miles. And then eventually when it hits the seafloor, it starts to drill through the sediments. And then we can obtain this uh, course of the sediments that represent continuous and most reliable source of the long-term climate change on the scale of thousands and millions of years. So now question, how do we actually form reflect the um, reflect the climate and here's the way here's the explanation 
In order to build a shell around its organism, Foraminifera takes the elements from the seawater. So it takes calcium, carbon, and oxygen from the seawater. And that's why forums then record the chemistry of the seawater in which they grow. Uh, Foraminifera have very short lifespan. Planktonic forums live two to four weeks. And when the organism dies, uh, shell of this organism descends to the seafloor and then get trapped in the sediments. So what geologists do after that, we drill for those sediments, we wash them in order to collect the shells of the um, foraminifera, and then we study the chemistry of those shells in order to understand the chemistry of the ocean. And you know what? Ocean is a covers 70% of our planet, and it is a very big storage of the heat on our planet. So by knowing chemistry of the ocean and temperature of the ocean, we can actually reconstruct the climate of the entire planet. And that's why foraminifera are Earth microscopic climate record keepers. So now, what are those um, chemical parameters that we actually measure in foraminifera? And one of the main tools that we use as paleoclimatologists for reconstructions of past climate are ratios of oxygen isotopes. So what are those oxygen isotopes? There are two different types of oxygen that we measure in the, light, in the lab. One is heavy and one is light. The heavy isotope has mass 18 and the light isotope has mass 16. And both of this oxygen are present in the seawater. So foraminifera takes both of this oxygen uh, in order to build its calcite shell. And in the lab, we can detect and we can measure the, uh, the, num the concentrations of both of this oxygen. And the ratio of this heavy to light isotope is not constant on the seawater. And it actually depends on the temperature and it depends the temperature of the ocean and temperature of the um, of the planet. So by measuring changes in the ratios of heavy to light isotope, we can actually determine the changes in the temperatures of the ocean. And the ratio of heavy to light isotope is very small number. So in order to operate with those numbers, we multiply them by a thousand. That's why the oxygen isotopic ratios are measured in per mil. The sign over here that looks real interesting, that looks like percent, it's called per mil, parts per thousand. So how do the oxygen isotope works and why do we have changes in uh, the ratios of heavy to light isotope in the seawater? So when you have two object, objects, light object and a heavy object, which one it will be easy to move? Well, obviously it will be much easier to move the light object. Well, that's the same happens in nature. So we have seawater, H2O, and those molecules have both um, molecules of water with heavy isotope and molecules of water with light isotope. So when the um, seawater evaporates, the light um, molecules of water with light oxygen evaporate much easier. Uh, so this light oxygen then is present in this water vapor in the cloud, then afterwards moves and it rains out. Uh, when it moves to colder regions, it actually snows out. And when the snow um, falls down, and um, get accumulated on the land, it's finally converted to the ice. And this is how we build ice on land. So as a result of this process, we have this snap effect. When we remove um, light oxygen from the seawater, leaving the seawater increased uh, with increased proportion of heavy oxygen, and then we store this light oxygen in the ice on land. Um, and this is the changes in the oxygen um, isotopic composition of the seawater 
are going to be reflected in the oxygen isotopic composition of foraminifera that was living in the ocean during those times. So when we measure oxygen isotope in forums and we see higher values in oxygen isotopes, it will indicate that there was more ice on land and colder climate. When we measure lower oxygen isotopic values, it will indicate less ice on land and warmer climate. So now that you know this relationship between oxygen isotopes and uh, temperatures and amount of sea ice and amount of ice um, on the planet, I uh, now uh, invite you to be a paleoclimatologist and reconstruct the climate with me uh, for the last uh, six to seven million years ago or the Cenozoic era. And in order to do that, we will use the uh, compilation of the oxygen isotopic records from more than 40 open ocean drilling sites that were drilled by the, um, by the um, IUDP uh, program. Uh, and what I show here is the oxygen isotopic values of benthic foraminifera, which is called CBD sedoides. Here's the photograph of the shell. It's less than one millimeter. And um, it leaves, um, this foraminifera is benthic, so they live on the seafloor. So they record conditions of the water of, um, in the, on the ocean floor. Just to remind you, um, there is an inverse relationship between oxygen isotopes and temperatures. That's why we usually plot oxygen ratios in reverse. So the more negative values will indicate warmer temperatures here to the right, and more positive values will indicate colder temperatures to your left. So let's go through the Cenozoic era and see what did happen based on the um, oxygen isotopic ratio of Cebicidoides. So the warmest climate during the Cenozoic era was 50 million years ago. And you see the spike over here. This is the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum event that I was studying for my PhD, the global warming event. Then there is the next um, big shift towards more positive uh, ratios um, at 34 million years ago. This is when the South Pole of the Earth started to um, have the ice sheets. So we have buildup of Antarctic ice sheets. After that, there is another um, big shift towards positive values at 14 millions of years. This is when we have the permanent Antarctic ice sheet. And finally, around 3 million years ago, we have another uh, large increase in um, oxygen isotopes at 3 million years ago. This is when we have major northern hemisphere wow. ice sheet appears. And when we look in more general on the climate trends, we can see that the Cenozoic era, or the last six to seven million years ago, is characterized by overall cooling trend. And we can, um, we can say this by um, by seeing this increase in oxygen isotopic ratios. But the actual changes in the climate and all these reasons for why did this change, it's the topic for the uh, entire different lecture. And today I just wanted to talk to you about the microfossils and how we use them as the major tool for the climate reconstruction of the past. And one question that you're probably curious about, why do we actually care about the past climate? Well, first of all, personally, it's really fun. I really like to be a climate investigator, and I think it is really important to know the history of our um, of climate of our planet. And another reason is the following. Um, Scottish geologist Charles Lyell, who is considered to be a father of founders of geology, uh, said that the present is the key to the past. And so it is the truth for our future. 
think about it. What is the one of the main concerns for our society today? It is a global warming that we created by human activities. And that's why it is really crucial to understand how the global warming affected the planet in the past in order to get realistic predictions for the future. And my job is to, um, is to take a part in the reconstruction of our past. And I hope uh, you will learn something new and interesting about the way how we do such climate reconstructions. And with that, I would like to open up discussion for the questions and thank you for your attention. So Masha, you can stop sharing your screen. Uh huh. And then you can go to, the, there you go. Okay, let me just pull up the questions that I received from you. Well, there are a lot of, okay. So, Here's the questions. Mary from Somerset would like to know, what countries do you find the tiny fossils? And as I said in the beginning, the, for me, for I mostly prefer to live in the, um, in the warmer conditions. So when you go to subtropical or tropical areas um, in the, um, in the, um, on the shore or most probably to the, um, um, to more of a deep ocean, you'll find them over there. But honestly, you can find foraminifera in the ocean everywhere. And uh, if, for example, for my research, I do um, study foraminifera that, foraminiferal shells uh, from the Paleocene and Eocene epochs 56 million years ago. And I go to New Jersey to drill for those sediments. So you can find foraminiferal, foraminiferal shells literally everywhere. Ryan from Lanoka Harbor would like to know, how can the um, layperson find, collect, and store microfossils without losing them? So in order to find them, you need to have a sediment. If you're looking for planktonic foraminifera, it's going to be um, ocean sediments because foramin planktonic foraminifera don't live in the fresh water. They only live in the ocean. Uh, for benthic foraminifera that live on the, um, um, on the shore, you can also find them in more coastal areas, in the marshes, so they can tolerate much lower salinities. So you need to have a sediment and then you need to wash the sediment and let me actually show you i would like to share one of the slides because there was another question for about washing um sediments and how do we get foraminifera out of them just give me a moment Okay, so we take those sediments and uh, we, because foraminifera are very small in size, they're microscopic, we are uh, using sieves that have a, um, the opening of 63 microns. This is the size above which there is, it, it's a sand size. Um, and we, wash so we wash all the clays and fine particles in order to collect the foraminifera then we put this um residue the coarse fraction or the sand fraction we put it in this uh paper uh, paper bags we dry them in the oven 
because we need to have loose material. And then we also use this set of tiny um, sieves because all foraminiferal shells have different sizes. So we use a sieves of different sizes in order to separate them by size. And then we toss them, as I said, we toss them on a black tray, we use the brush, and then we um, put them on the slides. So if we don't use foraminifera for uh, measuring their chemical composition, foraminifera are also amazing uh, indicators for of relative age of the sediments. And in order not to lose them or just to collect them, we can put apply a layer of glue on this black slides and we can glue foraminifera. And this is how we uh, make the slides of the forums that we really don't want to lose because using the brush, sometimes forums really jump away. So you really need to be meticulous and very careful when you work with the forums. So glue is one of the ways to uh to make sure that they're going to stay in the slide and then we also use the glass cover that we put on the slide to protect our forums and also not uh, make sure that they're not getting dusty okay let me go back to the list of other questions and obviously, um, you need to have a microscope. So um, for, you know, for a lay person, it's probably going to be hard to study in them. So you will need to find a microscope somewhere in order to collect them. Okay, so Mary from Scotch Plains has a lot of questions. And um, I'll just choose, I don't know if we have enough time, but I'll choose a few from them. Um, so how old does a dead microorganism have to be to be considered a fossil? Well, as long as, um, as it dies and the shell descends and uh, trapped in the, in the sediments, this is a fossil. We also study modern foraminiferal uh, um, shells, so they're also fossils. Um, do, micro, do microorganisms mineralize as well as fossilize? So those microorganisms, they uh, build the shells around them and they build up um, based on the different minerals. Forums and coccolithophores have calcium carbonate um, shells, diatoms and radiolarians have silica. And when they are trapped in the, um, in the sediment, sometimes they um, are subjected for remineralization. So they also can be replaced sometimes with pyrate, fool's gold, um, and with um, some other minerals. So that's why when we study chemical composition of the fossils, microfossils that we use to reconstruct climate, it's really important to make sure that this material that we study is pristine and it was not affected by the processes of the remineralization. How do we separate out the fossils from any metrics or stuff around them? This is a good question. I just showed you how do we clean the sediment from the fossil. So for example, for the clay uh, um, samples, we use this, um, uh, um, we use this um, material called, which is similar to Calgon, which is the, uh, you know, the cleaning powder. What it does, it deflocculates clay and converts it from being very compacted to being muddy. So we can wash this clay away uh, using our sieve. Um, Does anything else besides temperature effects, um, spirals, or other characteristics such as salinity? That is an amazing question. Uh, today, I only talked about the oxygen isotopes that we measure in foraminifera, and they are affected by the uh, temperature and by the oxygen composition of the water itself. 
but we also have many different characteristics that we can measure in forums. Let's say the ratio of trace elements such as magnesium, such as boron, such as iodine. And those um, uh, changes in those uh, trace elements concentration can also be used as the proxies to understand the changes in the temperature, to understand changes the, in the pH of the seawater, of the ocean contact, and also we can determine um, variations in the salinity. So it's just so many various um, uh, proxies that we can use for aminifera for. And I really, um, it, it's, I, I can speak for days just about how we can use forums for um, environmental and climate reconstructions. And I was mostly talking about, you know, those things that we measure in planktonic forms, but benthic foraminifera themselves, um, they live at the different depths and they live in the different environments with different salinity. So by looking at the assemblages of what kind of benthic forms we find, we can, um, uh, we can get an idea about the paleo depth of that location and paleo salinity of that location. Okay. Um, oh, we've got a lot of more. So I will, if I have more time, I'll move to Mary's questions back. Uh, okay. Here's the um, famous section. Ria's mom's questions. Uh, Ria's mom would like to know in which parts of the ocean do you find the most abundant benthic foraminifera? Well, uh, most abundant. So the idea is that foraminifera need, they don't produce any um, organic matter. They need to eat. So they need to have food. And obviously in the places where there is not much food, let's say in the deep ocean, we won't, we won't find as, as many benthic foraminifera. So majority of the benthic foraminifera will be found in the um, shelf area. This is where we'll have the, um, the most variety of the benthic forms, but there is also plenty of them in the deep ocean as well. Patricia would like to know, do you get as far back in time when you drill, um, do you get back as far back in the time when you drill in New Jersey? So in New Jersey, uh, we can drill up to the Cretaceous time, so we can get, and in fact, New Jersey is one of the um, famous locations where geologists study the KPG boundary, the boundary that separates the Mesozoic and the Cenozoic eras when the dinosaurs died. So we go back to the Cretaceous in New Jersey. Carol would like to know how the foraminifera changed in structural varieties much over time. If so, what sort of changes? And this is a great question, and I totally even forgot to mention when did forums evolve and um, how long they've been present and changed in the, um, in, on our planet. Foraminifera um, abundant fossils for the last 540 million years ago. So they evolved in the, uh, in the Cambrian time. And for a majority of the time, there were only benthic foraminifera present. And planktonic foraminifera evolved only during the Mesozoic time. Uh, but forums are really great indicators of the relative age of rocks because they evolve relatively fast and they live, you know, they're abundant in the ocean. So when we drill for sediments, we can actually see uh, by looking at the changes in foraminiferal assemblages, we can actually tell uh, what is the relative age um, of the sediments that we're currently studying. And they've been, um, and I would say benthic foraminifera, it's a totally different topic. They have so many um, different types of uh, benthic forms, sometimes they're not even shells of benthic forms. Sometimes they just stick the uh, particles, like the grains of the sand, to form this kind of sticks. So benthic foraminifera, it's totally different uh, type, and there's so many varieties. Planktonic foraminifera usually have this 
uh, beautiful um, popcorn-like shells. And they also quite different in size. And during the Cretaceous time, we had very large foraminiferous, uh, very um, uh, variety of them. Um, after the KPG mass extinction, most of the foraminifera were quite small and there are only three species that survived the KPG extinction. So they are varying in the size, but more or less they will be all this kind of popcorn looking creatures. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Okay, Ria's mom, again, would like to know, do hydrothermal vents after the chemistry, um, alter the chemistry of microfossil shells? Uh, well, depending on the, um, uh, depending on the solution that goes through those veins, yes, they can do. Um, so, for example, there, if there is H2S, we can have um, from sulfur, we can have some precipitation of pyrite. If there is a um, some sort of more acidic environment, we can dissolve some of the um, some of the foraminiferal shells. So yeah, when they are affected to higher temperatures, they can greatly affect uh, the the original composition of the shells. Okay. Patricia would like to know, what is the current hypothesis for cause of the warming of the PETM? Is, is it still the methane released from the ocean floor? So methane release uh, from the ocean floor is a mechanism that is, um, that explains the, um, the carbon isotopic, the change in the carbon isotopic composition that we see worldwide um, the best because methane has very negative carbon isotopic composition. So it um, was originally considered as the, uh, one of the triggers for the, um, for the global warming event, which is called the PETM. But lately, there are two more hypotheses that are becoming more and more popular. During the Paleocene Eocene time, there was also um, eruptions in the North Atlantic uh, um, magmatic province, and um, the release of the CO2 from those um, eruptions uh, is one of the um, mechanisms for the warming. CO2 and methane are greenhouse gases. When we increase the amount of these gases in the atmosphere, we um, we enhance greenhouse effect and warm the planet. And the latest hypothesis, uh, which is a dramatic catastrophic hypothesis that actually originated um, at Rutgers University, is the cometary impact. Um, so there was a comet that struck the Earth. Um, it released, it has a lot of light carbon um, in the uh, in the, in the comets, so it released again a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, created the um, global warming and greenhouse effect. And in fact, we still don't know. There are favorable hypotheses, three of them I just mentioned right now, dissociation of methane hydrates, volcanism and cometary impact, but we still are not sure. And probably they're just not one trigger. Uh, maybe it's just a combination of a few. What is my favorite forum? Oh, um, my favorite forum is called Sabotna. This is a foraminifera from uh, the Paleocene Eocene time. It's really beautiful. And why I like it? Because it's so much easy to identify it. And it so far gave the most beautiful records um, of the oxygen isotopes. Uh, that I've obtained from the New Jersey course. So that's why it's my favorite one. It's easy to work with and it produces, and produces beautiful data. What question do you want to research next? Um, so I'm still working on the PETM, uh, but uh, for my latest project, I'm also looking at the um, evolution of the thermal evolution of the North Atlantic during the last 20 million years ago. So we're getting into the modern ocean circulation at that time. 
and I'm trying to see how did the ocean structure and how did the temperatures in the ocean changed um, going from the subtropical uh, places towards the polar and how did the evolution of the Gulf Stream happen. And for to do that, I also look at the um, oxygen isotopes of foraminifera. Why did you become a geologist? Good question. I don't know. Um, I had no idea what geology is before I started my um, undergraduate. And um, after taking my first geology class, I just fell in love with geology. And I never saw my, I'm from Moscow, Russia. There's no mountains around. I've never been to the ocean or to the sea before I was um, 10. And, and I was just never surrounded by rocks and outcrops. So in my freshman year, that's the first time when I learned about geology, when I went to my field camp and I just fell in love with that. So it was a blind date with geology and I've been in love with it since then. What motivated you to select geology and not oceanography or biology? Well, um, as I just said, geology is, a I didn't know what about geology and when I started studying, I really liked it and I love biology, evolution and paleontology. So just, you know, combining all of these things together, I think brought me to where I am today, a paleoclimatologist. I really like to be this detective. That's why I chose not oceanography. It's when you study the ocean. Um, physical oceanography, chemical, biological oceanography, in general, ocean today. That's why I prefer to be a geologist and paleoceanographer to go and investigate what was going on with the ocean and the clim climate back in the past. Why did you change from petroleum geology to paleoclimatology? Um, I tried it. I, it wasn't a you know intention. I got scholarship to do masters at Rutgers, and I had no idea. I did um, some research in marine geology, but I didn't know anything about climatology, paleoclimatology. And when I moved to Rutgers, that was the first time when I learned about foraminifera, microfossils, uh, paleoclimatology. And at that moment, I really uh, became interested in doing this research and then decided to switch from um, having more of an industrial work to having a scientific academic job. I really like to do research. I really like to be in a lab. I love interacting with my, um, with, with my colleagues, with researchers. I love teaching students. And that's why I switched to paleoclimatology. Mm -hmm. Ria Moms would like to know, uh, does ocean acidification bring about chemical and physiological changes in foraminifera? Uh, they do change the chemical composition of forums, of forum shells, and we can detect it by measuring shells of foraminifera. For example, changes in boron, that's element, it's, it's a trace element in the um, composition of the foraminifera shells when we measure the changes in boron concentration in the shells we can um, we can see the changes in the seawater pH and also physiologically yes sometimes we have malformation of foraminifera shells so obviously changes in pH changes in acidity it's a stress for foraminifera. So sometimes we will have some sort of weird, weird looking chambers of foraminifera. It's not really usual, but yes, the um, environment, this is what actually triggers the changes in the, in the foraminifera. What places have you traveled as a geologist? Oh, unfortunately, for my own research, I mostly travel to the core repository, which is located in Livingston campus at Rutgers University. Um, and and um, for my PTM research, I go to uh, to drill course on the New Jersey um, on the New Jersey coastal plain. 
But I've been to so many places during the field camp, not for my own research, but as a field camp. And the U.S., I've been to New Mexico, Texas. I've been to Book Cliffs in Utah, in Arizona. And in the U.S., it's just, it's amazing how many gorgeous um, exposures of rocks you can find. So, um, I've been to a bunch of places in Russia, in Ukraine as well. I've been to places in Europe. Um, but for my own research, I mostly stick to New Jersey. And I think that unfortunately we are running out of time. And I hope that I was able to answer most of the questions. You can also, if you're interested in this topic, you can also send me an email. You can find my information on the Rutgers uh, Geology Department website, and I'll be really happy to help you out uh, in understanding a little bit more about micropaleontology and paleoclimatology. And once again, I'd like to thank you for your attention. It was really amazing to, um, to be a speaker for you today. Thanks, Masha. That was really great. Um, well, for everyone, thanks again for joining us. And don't forget to join us next Tuesday on June 9th at 2 p.m. We'll have Kirsten Formoso, uh, and she will be talking to us from the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County uh, about mosasaurs. So I'm sure that's something we're all looking forward to. And that's that next week on Tuesday. Thanks again, Masha, and have a nice day, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.